Hey there once again YouTube, so I'm back once again, I'm still around, don't you worry. It's 10.04 p.m. Pacific Time, October 15, 2019. Just want to let you know that I am still updating some things on my website, so go to the links in the description box below, check out my website, it teach you how to find, access, and analyze seismic and GPS data, and even has a bunch of seismic plots for many, many different things on here, so I'm sure you'll really like my website if you're into seismic activity. Now we're going to talk about two earthquakes that recently happened. One was a magnitude 4.5 near Pleasant Hill, California, excuse me, just to the east of San Francisco, the east-northeast-ish. Now it did not occur along the San Andreas Fault itself, but it did occur just to the east, maybe related, but I think it's more connected to the Concord Fault, which stretches all throughout this area and connects to the Green Valley Fault Zone right up here near Benicia and Martinez and Concord, California. Now there was also a 3.4 aftershock as part of that sequence. And if you zoom in, 36 earthquakes have already been reported. We'll take a look at the seismic data in just a second. There was a 2.5 and a 1.7 aftershock. And surprisingly, this magnitude 2.5, the force shock, excuse me, if I called it an aftershock, I'm wrong. I meant force shock apparently saw some strong shaking just for a magnitude 2.5, so that's pretty surprising. But the magnitude 4.5 itself near San Francisco was at 14 kilometers in depth. Just want to update you guys and let you know that that happened. One more thing happened, which I'll let you know about, but over 68,000 people uh, reported this event. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, and a lot more people probably actually felt it. And I did hear and we did see that a lot of people very far away from the epicenter did feel this earthquake. And it primarily looks like a strike-slip event, which is pretty much what a lot of the fault zones are around that area, especially the San Andreas Fault, I believe. But I do know the San Andreas Fault is a right lateral strike-slip fault. And we do see this primarily a strike-slip earthquake. Even though it was far away from San Andreas, there probably are other strike-slip uh, faults in this area. But it still could be connected in some way, because after this magnitude 4.5, uh, and then, by the way, that occurred at 5.33 UTC on the 15th. But actually, that would have been about 10.33 p.m. yesterday on the 14th. Because, you know, UTC is ahead from us uh, on the Pacific Coast. About what? I think, uh, by seven hours? Ahead of us by seven, eight hours? Something like that? Then all the way down here to the south earlier. Today, we saw magnitude 4.7 actually along the San Andreas Fault itself. 10.1 kilometers in depth. Not as many people reported feeling this earthquake, but the shaking was strong associated to this magnitude 47, which as we can see occurred on the San Andreas, and this is a strike slip earthquake. And something that's very rare, very, 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 very rare, is for USGS to write a description for a 4.7. That's really rare. They usually write descriptions for magnitude 6 or magnitude 7 and above earthquakes. This earthquake appears to have occurred on the San Andreas Fault. The boundary between the North American Pacific tectonic plates. This part of the San Andreas Fault is famous for fault creep, which is slow, relatively continuous movement that has been observed to occur on only a few dozen continental faults worldwide. Creeping faults release much of their tectonic strain through this slow, which would be slow slip, relatively steady movement, but they can also produce earthquakes of up to magnitude 7. This region of the San Andreas Fault has produced numerous moderate sized earthquakes in the past, and today's earthquake fits into this pattern. Okay, that's not really the questions we are asking ourselves, but okay. It's almost 6,000 people reported feeling it. Again, strike slip event along the San Andreas, 4.7. Something they did not address, though, which I wish they would have addressed, is how come California has been relatively quiet in this location near San Francisco and along the San Andreas, but right when a 4.5 hits up here near San Francisco, then less than 24 hours later, we have a 4.7 on the San Andreas. Interesting how there was no answer of that in there. I, you know, it would have been kind of nice for them to tie in why it's been so calm for so long in this area, and then all of a sudden two mid-range magnitude fours pop off within less than 24 hours of each other. So, I mean, maybe it's just a coincidence, but I've seen this a lot, especially around the world, where the world will be very seismically quiet for weeks, if not months. And then all of a sudden, an earthquake will pop off, then another one, then a big one, and then another big one, and then it'll calm back down again. So there's got to be some sort of connection, even from thousands of miles away, there's got to be some sort of connection with these earthquakes in some way. May I don't know, maybe I'm just putting patterns where there aren't any. Let me know below what you guys believe. But this one down here 
It was a 4.7 to 10.1 kilometers in depth, right near Gonzales and Soldat in California. Now we're going to take a look at the magnitude 4.5 just real quick in the seismic program swarm from the closest seismic station. Again, this is the first quake that hit. And then less than 24 hours later, we did see the magnitude 4.7 along the San Andreas. Let's go to origin, see what the closest seismic station is. Scroll down a little bit. All right, it is, I'm going to use a broadband station. Let's use BRIB in the BK network. Here you have BRIB in the BK network, and I did add a 1 hertz high pass filter to the 8th power just to get rid of those pesky background microseisms. Now starting off, you'll notice this earthquake is extremely strange if you're used to looking at seismic signatures. And we do have the P and S wave arrival as usual, but look at this, uh, part of the S wave arrival, some extreme low frequencies. Look at that, guys, right there. I'm unsure if this, these are surface waves. It only took 2.7 seconds to reach this station, so I really do not believe these are surface waves at all from anything. So I don't know why the frequencies are so low. Though. Let's go to the spectrogram. The quake was so strong, it's kind of hard to see those lower frequencies. So why don't we go and increase the maximum power range? There you go. Now look at that. You can see some very strong lower frequencies right between, I'm going to say, 1 hertz to about 3 to 4 hertz. Was not a low frequency earthquake, as you can tell. Here, let's put the power back to the way it was. Was not a low frequency earthquake, of course, but it did have some very strong lower frequencies in the S wave, which is very strange for an earthquake of this formation in this location. Very, very odd, guys. I don't, don't know why that would be like that. Just from looking at it, it literally looks like a quarry blast. So sometimes quarry blasts have these high frequencies and then these lower frequencies near the S wave at the end. So I really don't know what was going on there, guys. And after that 4.5 near San Francisco, you can see many aftershocks. Look at all those earthquakes, guys. Those are all earthquakes. Yeah, so it did have a lot of aftershocks involved. And here's the foreshock. This was a foreshock just prior to the magnitude 4.5 near San Francisco. Again, the kind of seeing those lower frequencies we saw with the 4.5, but not really right there. Let's look at this one. Kind of seeing those lower frequencies, but not as much as we did with the actual 4.5. I mean, look at that. Very strange, guys. Very, very strange. Okay. And moving forward on the seismic station, of course, we can see the 4.7 down near San Andreas, but this was a station that was far away since it occurred many miles to the south. So we're going to go take a look at this in the closest seismic station to the San Andreas earthquake that occurred today. But first to do that, we need to go down here, go to the 4.7 right here, which actually saw a magnitude 2.74 shock just a little bit to the southeast along San Andreas. I did not notice that until now. So both the earthquakes did have a foreshock or two. A foreshock is an earthquake that occurs prior to an earthquake. Um, because a lot of sequences are foreshock, main shock, aftershock, but you don't know something's the foreshock until the main shock hits. And that's something scientists are trying to figure out right now. They're trying to figure out a way to tell what foreshocks are related to just regular earthquakes popping off. Again, this 4.7 along the San Andreas was strike slip. And 10.1 kilometers in depth. Let's go to origin just real quick. I want to let you guys know, if you lived in California, please have your emergency preparedness kits, earthquake kits, and stuff like that ready to go, just in case I'm not saying a big earthquake is going to happen for sure. But whenever activity increases, or, or you know, even when activity doesn't increase, you should always be prepared for this stuff because earthquakes can pop off e in the middle of the night when you're not prepared, when you're when you're in the shower. I mean, you should always be prepared and have some type of bug out bag re ready to go. Um, okay, so <laughs> so B job and the NC network short period vertical is the closest seismic station to this event. Let's take a look at the 4.7 along the San Andreas in the seismic program swarm. All right, here we have B-Job in the NC network up here. We do see the magnitude 4.5, which occurred near San Francisco, kind of near the San Andreas Fault, but a little bit to the east-northeast of it. Uh, going forward, now we do see right down here, excuse me, let me try to move this real quick. Right down here. Now, again, this station is the closest seismic station. Took about the same amount of time to reach this station as the 4.5 did to station BRIB that I just showed a little bit ago. So we should see somewhat of the same things. However, look at what we are seeing with this earthquake. Look at the waveforms. Now, this is the 4.7. This is not the 4.5 that I just showed. This is the 4.7 along the San Andreas. Look what we see along the S waves. 
Notice that, those strange lower frequencies, which usually I do not see with earthquakes associated with strike slip motion in this location. And so we saw it with the 4.5 in San Francisco, and then less than 24 hours later, we saw another earthquake farther to the south along the San Andreas with the same strange lower frequencies in the S wave. That's really weird, at least in my opinion. I mean, they almost look like the same exact type of earthquake, but why is the such, let me look at these. Why? Look at how low those frequencies are. Here, let's go to the spectrogram for the 4.7. I'm going to add a 1 hertz high pass filter just real quick to the 8th power. Okay. Yeah, you, you still can see those lower frequencies in the S wave. And let's go to the spectrogram. Let's go to the spectrogram options and increase the frequency power, the power range, excuse me, to 150. So you can see there were some very strong lower frequencies, not surpassing 8 or 9 hertz. Um, but, of course, we see strong frequencies going well beyond that. So it was not a low-frequency earthquake, guys. It was not. But it did have some very peculiar, excuse me, peculiar lower frequencies within the S wave, which I find very intriguing. I have no idea why. And let's zoom all the way out. After the 4.7 along the San Andreas, you can clearly see multiple aftershocks striking this region. With some higher frequencies and not many lower frequencies, which is kind of strange. But I don't know what's going on here, guys. I don't know. But after that, I mean, earthquake activity is still popping off there. I mean, look at all these aftershocks associated to this along the San Andreas Fault. We are still seeing, oh, what is this? Oh, you know what? I think that's the 2.5 from Long Valley Super Volcano. I don't know for sure, though. Going forward, though, you can see here's another earthquake. Here's an, Oh, that's not one. Never mind. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. I mean, they were popping off. A good amount, which I find very intriguing. So seismic activity is definitely increasing in California, but it's only 4.5 and 4.7 so far. Could they be four shocks to a larger event? Nobody can know that until the large event happens. So regardless, you should always have an earthquake preparedness kit. And I'm up here in Washington, and we haven't seen a 5.0 or greater since 2001. So really, it's just as dangerous up here in Washington, guys. So everyone should always have an earthquake preparedness kit ready to go. You don't know when that's going to pop off. Uh, let's see if anything has happened since I have been recording. By the way, Steamboat Geyser and the Norris Geyser Basin at Yellowstone National Park has not erupted yet. Has not erupted yet. Nothing too crazy has occurred while I've been recording, so that's about it, guys. And I expect Steamboat to erupt tonight or tomorrow morning, based on the precursors that are currently shown. Uh, yeah, nothing much has happened, so... That's pretty much it for right now, guys. I'll probably do another update tomorrow if something else happens. Keep an eye out for my on my website on the Steamboat Geyser 2019 page for the plots for the next Steamboat eruption. Whenever you see Steamboat erupt, let's go to isthisthingon.org, actually, and let's see if it has erupted while I've been recording. Let's see. Nope, it has not erupted at all. Okay, but I expect it to tonight or tomorrow morning. So have a great day, guys, and God bless.